1 Timothy 2, verse number 8. The Bible says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And I want to draw your attention to that last part there, without wrath and doubting. Uh, the word doubt, or doubting in the variants, uh, the word doubt itself appears 33 times in your Bible. I won't take a lot of time there this evening uh, to go into that. Some you, you like to know that, you, you, you long to know those things. Others, uh, okay, well, what's that mean to me? <laughs> but uh, what is interesting in that is that all these variants uh, with that, the majority of that time appears in the New Testament, interestingly enough. And so it does give you, it makes you wonder as to why that, and I think there may be a reason behind it. We won't go into all that tonight. But uh, even how it's used in the Bible, it seems that one way it's used in, in a more of a fashion in one way in the New Testament than it is in the Old Testament. But we want to look at these things and see what the Lord has. Uh, it's connected, if you will. Uh, go ahead and turn over to Deuteronomy chapter number 28. It says, And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. Now, we won't go into the context of what's going on there, but I want you to notice how in that verse, the connection that's made. Notice, notice that doubt and fear are used in the same sentence. Doubting is co closely associated with fear in some cases. Uh, it, and we also see though, not only is it connected to fear, uh, but if you'll turn over to the New Testament, turn over to Matthew and read a couple of verses here in the, for this. Uh, it's connected to fear, <clears throat> but also it's connected to unbelief or a lack of faith. And that's where you see in the New Testament more so, you see it connected to a lack of faith than in the Old Testament. Matthew 14, verse number 31, it says there, Immediately Jesus stretched forth His hand and called Him and said unto Him, O thou of little faith, notice, wherefore didst thou doubt? And so if you're, in, a, in this case, and the word doubt is an exact opposite of faith. So if you have your doubts about your Lord and His ability, you have a lack of faith. You have a lack of faith. Matthew 21, 21, His answer and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. So again, the Lord Jesus Christ, He is using the word doubt in an exact opposite of faith. That is, hey, if you have faith and not doubt, so if we doubt, and if specifically if we doubt our Lord, then we have a lack of faith. You say, well, why is that so important? Because folks struggle. I don't know about you. It depends upon the subject, depends upon the matter. There's times I'll, I'll struggle, right? We all have our struggles, and it's different things. You know, I, you know one person may say, well, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a doubt of, of my salvation. And another person said, well, why are you struggling with that? I don't have that problem. Well, you don't, but that person does. You might have in a case where, you know, a child doesn't understand the fears and the woes of their parents when it comes to, well, you know, only this much is coming in this month and we got all these bills to pay. And, you know, the husband and wife look at each other and the wife looks at the husband and goes, what are we going to do? The husband says, thinks to himself, I don't have any answers at the moment. And, you know, the wife starts to doubt and wonder and gets nervous and her faith gets tried and, her, and she starts to doubt the Lord's ability and the ability of the household. And the children will go and like, I've always had food on the table. What's, what's the difference? But they're not the parent. We all have our struggles. And what's, what's a big thing to one person may be a small thing to another. And it's easy sometimes to judge and say, well, you just need more faith until you're the person in the box. And so, the, but we notice here there's a, but a doubt and unbelief is a lack of faith. Uh, notice, if you will, Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Now, this is a little different because this is more about not unbelief necessarily, not necessarily fear, 
And I'm trying to give you first the context of how the word is used in the Bible. Because your Bible is the best dictionary. Your Bible is the best... It's the best way to figure out a word and how God uses that word. Not Let's not run to the 1828. Let's not run, run to what this commentary says, what this person says. Let's go to the Bible first. And then if the dictionary backs that, then that's one thing. But let's see how it's used. Notice Luke 11, verse number 20. It says here, But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, and I'm sorry if I didn't tell you where, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, verse, chapter 11, verse number 20. This is Jesus Christ. He's talking to those around Him here, the, 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 the group. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, specifically, uh, probably the lawyers, doctors, Pharisees, Sadducees here, but if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now in this case, that's not fear. That's not faith. That is the, that's more of a, a confirmation. It's no doubt. That is, there's no question. You see the difference there? So in your Bible, there's times where you've got a reference to faith, a faith issue. You've got hesitation. You've got unbelief, you've got fear, but then there's also the use of the word in the, in the way of there's no doubt this has happened. That is, there's no question. In fact, it's, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself, but I'll go ahead and say this. You have where Jacob gets word about Joseph and the coat is presented to him. He says, no doubt some evil beast has torn him, has slain him. Well, that is, there's no question. He looks at the evidence, but of course we know the evidence was messed up. Right, right. But he says no doubt. There's, there's no question. He's dead. And so just, I'm wanting you to see the usage of the word because when you go to your Bible and you start reading, you, you see those things. <clears throat> but let's go to a few others uh, as well. Look at Acts. Look at Acts chapter number 10. Acts 10 verse number 17. This is Peter. He's up on top of the roof there. And the Lord brings him a vision of, of, the, of, this, of this sheet this, that comes down with all these different animals that are unclean. He's not supposed to eat those animals, right? But then the Lord says, slay and eat. And so this is done three times in the Bible there. Verse number 16. Verse number 17. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. Now understand, he's not doubting he saw it. It's not this, I'm not sure. It's not this, oh, I'm afraid of what I saw. It's Again, it's this, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with this. I'm questioning it. I'm questioning this. While he doubted, he's questioning, what does this mean? And so he says, Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Now let's jump on down. Look at verse number, look at verse number 20. Now look what the Lord does. I rise therefore and get thee down and go with them doubting nothing for I have sent them. In other words, hey Peter, I don't want you to doubt the vision. I don't want you to doubt the men that have come. I don't want you questioning. This is what I need you to do. Go and do it. You know, sometimes it's not the case of necessarily fear. It's not even necessarily the case of maybe even unbelief. Sometimes you've got, you're doubting and it's okay, Lord, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. Right? And I need direction. And so, again, you see the usage of this word in the Bible and you say, well, what's, how, what, why is that important? Because for us, there's times you do doubt with faith. Sometimes you have your hesitations. Maybe there's a lack of faith. Maybe there's fear. But maybe there's times of, Lord, it's not that I don't trust you. It's, I'm not sure what you want me to do with this. You ever had those doubts in your life? Sometimes, right? Sometimes. And I'll give you one more. I'll just read this one. 1 Corinthians 9, 10 says, Or saith he it all together for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. So again, you see there's, there's without question in that passage, in that verse. It's without question. And we'll, we'll show a little bit later why that's so important. And I want to be sure. I, Daniel 5.12. Because I think this works very well here. And in, in many ways, it's kind of... It speaks volumes. Daniel here stands before the king. 
And while the king believes that you know it's Daniel that can do these things, we know that it's the Lord. But it says here, For as much as an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams, and showing of hard sentences, and dissolving of doubts, were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. We know, yes, Daniel is dissolving doubts, but we know the God of Daniel. Do you know what's true about our God? He dissolves doubts. He dissolves doubt of fear. He dissolves doubts of hesitation and lack of faith. He also dissolves doubts of, that are questions. There's no questions left. He's a God of truth. And listen, I don't know, maybe someone here tonight, maybe you're doubting God's ability. Maybe you're doubting God's understanding. Maybe you're fearful. Maybe that's your doubt right now. Maybe you're feel, fearful of something. Maybe there's some news you've gotten today, this week. But let me tell you, you have a God in heaven that dissolves all doubts. <clears throat> there's a God in heaven that will, if you've got questions and hesitations, maybe it's ability for you, and in reality your ability lies in God. And maybe that's the problem. But you have a God that will dissolve your doubts. And so, no matter what it is, maybe it's a question of your salvation tonight. Maybe, maybe you've struggled for years and you have your doubts. Listen, listen, young person or old person alike, because there's people that struggle. You have a God that will dissolve those doubts, but you've got to lay that at the feet of Jesus. You've got to lay that at the feet of the Lord and say, Lord, I don't, I'm not sure. Well, get it... Get with God and get it sure. Because He's not... Our God is not a God of fear in the sense of we should fear God, but He's not a God that wants you to fear your eternity, your life, what's going on in your life. Because in, in the Lord is truth. In the Lord is safety. He, he, he's not a God of fear in that sense. He wants you to trust Him and rely on Him and put your trust in Him not only for your salvation, but for your daily needs. And again, I may be jumping a little bit too far ahead, but I thought it, I just feel like that needs to be said right there. Historically, historically, and, and now I'll give you these, historically doubt uh, is uncertainty with regard to the truth of something. Also, in its, in, when it being used in an action, it's to dread, fear, be afraid, question, hesitate, waver in your opinions. Do you see all that? Do you see that in some of the verses we've read? Does that sound like you tonight? <laughs> Wavering in opinion? <clears throat> Hesitating? Second guessing, we like to say. <laughs> it's doubting. And our God is not a God of doubt. Not in that sense. Now, a couple of other things. We've already mentioned Joseph, where Jacob believed he were to be dead. We also see that, uh, that the Lord, when He was dealing with His people in Numbers 14.30, we see another form of doubt come up. It says here in Numbers 14.30, Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua the son of none. Notice, doubtless. Well, it's without question. You know what the Lord says? Doubt. Without question, you're not going. Doubtless. Now, here's something I do want to point out. If you will, turn over to Psalm 126, verse number 6. Psalm 126, verse number 6 says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless... You know what that means? It's without question. Shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know what? We see here that the, that the psalmist, he's talking about that, that one that would have precious seed, would doubtless, as without question, would come again. Do you know what comes to mind? Well, we, we think about the, the sower, don't we? Luke chapter number 8, verse number 5. And you can turn over there if you'd like. Luke 8 and verse number 5. We think about that sower. 
that's mentioned in the Gospels. And in Luke 8, verse number 5, it says, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls there devoured it up. But we won't read all of this for sake of time. We understand that some fell upon the wayside. We understand some fell upon a rock. Some fell among thorns. And some fell on good ground. You know what you see? Well, if you look down in verse number 11... His disciples ask him when he comes to the side, you know, they, they go to the side and they start asking him what it's supposed to mean. And he says there in verse number 9, he says, And the disciples ask him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, The seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. Do you know what? And again, I, I, I hope I'm not stretching it too much. But we know that they, the Word of God is something that we have today. You know what we're supposed to do with the Word of God? We're supposed to tell the world. We're supposed to tell the world about a Savior. We're supposed to tell the world that there is one, for us today, there's one that has come to, sa to save our souls from a place called hell. Do you understand that if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you have that truth. You have Jesus Christ living inside of you. But there's also the case of doubting your salvation. Again, you know what? We have that precious seed. Notice again, and I'll just read it, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. Now, in application, we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 20. And now we are called to sow the precious seed of the Word of God. You know what the Lord has told us? Go and sow sow the seed, and doubtless come again with rejoicing. There's going to be some rejoicing, folks. There's going to be a day for us, there's going to be a day, that I believe, some, you know, sometimes we, we go out on the street, we go out and we do street preaching, we, we, we hand out tracts, we, we, we try to knock on doors, and sometimes people will, will they'll, they, they do not want what you have that you're trying to offer. Now sometimes there's great. There's people that come by. They hey hey, can we get you water? Can we give you this? You look, hey, we'll just share something with you. Sometimes people are, are wonderful about that. But you know, either way, we, I said this just the other day. We cannot save anyone. We are commanded to go. We are commanded to go and tell the world about a Savior. One day, one day, I hope to see one day, doubtless, to come again with rejoicing. One day we may find out, not may, I think we will find out, okay, because you know, you folks did this and this and this. Hey, this person got saved, this person got saved. Maybe you watered and someone else reaped it. Paul talks about that. How that one had watered, one had sown, one had watered, and the other got the increase. But it would seem, based upon Paul's teaching and what we see in Scripture, we may all get to benefit from that. It looks like, looks like, hey, God's not going to say, well, because they got it, they get the crown or they get the reward. No, no, no. It seems like that, hey, I'm going to have a reward for you and you and you. Three or four people were involved in this individual getting saved. There's a reward for this and this one, this one, this one. Dallas, come again with rejoicing. Christian, it's worth it. It's well worth it. And so doubtless, without question, there's going to be some rewards. For your labor, stay in the fight. Mm -hmm. Stay in the fight. Don't start doubting. Keep on keeping on. <coughs> now again, in regard to doubting fear, that is, against faith, we see Christ's dialogue with Peter in Matthew chapter number 14. Turn over there if you will. Verse number 27, of course we know the story. Jesus comes walking on the water toward them. It says, But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth His hand and called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, uh, the other disciples didn't even get out of the boat, right? 
At least Peter tried. But boy, when he got out there, you know what happened? He got to looking around and seeing the wind and the waves. And he took his eyes off the Lord and he began to sink. You know what our problem is? Many times, many times, we start and boy, we see the world, whether it's the fear of the world, the things go on in our... Hey, you try to do something for the Lord and then this smacks you down. And that smacks you down. Some of you get sick two, three times in a row. Sometimes it's something else. Maybe it's a financial difficulty. Maybe it's something else that's going on in your life. And you start getting depressed. And you start getting discouraged. And you start to doubt. Does God even care? Does God even see what's going on in my life? Does God even hear me? But you know what caused all that? You got your eyes on the problems of this world. Right. You got your eyes off, and maybe it's not even that. Maybe you start seeing, well, you know, Joe over there, I don't know if he's had a problem in six years. And boy, they just got, boy, they, that just happened to them. Boy, boy, I'd like to have that happen. It's not the problem, it's you've been envious now. Yeah. And you're still getting your eyes off the one that called you out of the boat to begin with. Right. And you start to doubt. Does Jesus care? Does God care? Does God even care? I'm suffering over here. <laughs> it's doubting. It's still faith and fear. It's still faith and trouble. And one is greater than the other at that point in time. How is your faith tonight? It seems that doubt is manifested more, I said this a moment ago, in the way of fear in the New Testament than in the Old. Now again, that's just, just my study on it, uh, preparing for tonight. But in this is a great example, though, of our needed faith. Number one, you need faith for salvation. Number two, though, and this is where I think a lot of Christians get hung up. And so, I, oh, I had faith. Lord saved me. Faith is an exercise on a daily basis in your life, my friend. And the sooner you understand that and live it and work it, the better it will be. And it's experience that Jesus, that the Lord is always there each and every day. And you've got to rely on Him. We see that doubt is either uncertainty of something or fear that we see right here. Now, and, I've, and I've already kind of mentioned this, but have you doubted God's care or love for you? Have you? Have you doubted your salvation? You know, the Lord tells you that He'll never leave you nor forsake you, according to Hebrews 13, verse number 5. That's a promise. It's a promise from the Lord. And that's a promise for the Christian that maybe is not struggling with their salvation. And that, hey... I've, I didn't go anywhere. You think, I've, you think I'm out of touch, but I'm still here. I, I, I'm in the boat with you in the storm. Remember, He's the master of the sea. Remember the Psalm 107, how that He actually at times sends the storm so that you can learn to trust Him more. Right, right. <laughs> mm. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, John 10 and verse number 27. For those that may be in, my, in, my, in the midst here tonight, and those watching or may watch this, and maybe you've doubted your salvation, this is a, a set of verses that really helped me. I was about, about, a, about 11, 12, maybe as old as 13, but I feel like I was about 12. You know, time kind of flees. But I was, it was either an early teen or just quite, not quite a teen. And I, I, was, I, I was struggling with, okay, I was, you know, I, I'd, I'd got saved today. At least that's what I believe. And I was struggling with it. Lord, did I say everything? Did I say it the right way? Am I sure? John 10, verse number 27. And there was a, there was a lot of verses, but this one day sitting down, dealing with it for like, it felt like the 30th time as a, as a boy, really. I sat down and, and I just prayed again and said, Lord, if, if I didn't, 
would you please save me right now? Because I, I want to be. Because I, you know, I, I heard it all. It's like, if I cannot settle my own salvation, how can I be a witness for the Lord? Now that right there is a good indication. If I wanted to be a witness for the Lord as, at 12, but as a young man, you know, it's, Lord, I, I, need to, I need to settle this. So John 10, verse number 27, the Bible says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And this next set of words is very precious, very reassuring, because He gives them eternal life, right? And they shall never perish. And notice the rest of the verse. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Christian, there was nothing you could do in of yourself to get salvation other than call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's nothing that you can do to lose your salvation. You can't give it back. The Bible, you know, many years later as I'm learning more and more Bible, oh, I'm sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Well, if I'm sealed, that's like being preserved. It, it's, it's that... It's that, it's that uh, uh, it, it's that assurance of salvation. It's that earnest of the Spirit. Earnest is, hey, I've, I've given you the earnest of my Spirit. I'm coming again for you. Right. It's like when you buy a house, you put down earnest money. Hey, I'm coming back for that. I will buy that in 30 days. He's the earnest of the Spirit. Folks, what a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I read that for, again, finally one day, I was like, wait a minute, I'm in Jesus and the Son, Jesus, is in the Father and the Father is greater than all. That means the devil can't take me. His de de devils can't take me. No man can take me. I feel pretty secure. Yeah, yeah. And it's just one day that just, it finally all clicked, if you want to call it that. Folks, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so if you're struggling tonight, may I tell you, doubt is not from God. Now get it right. If it's bothering you, take care of it. But get it settled and get it done. Do not let that, don't hang that, don't let that hang over your head like a sword for the rest of your life. Get it settled. Because God is able. God is able. And not only that, we see that doubts and depressions are not of God. You know, God would have us bring our troubling thoughts, those things that trouble us, just like a doubt of salvation. He would want us to bring them into captivity to Him. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So, if ladies especially, again, men deal with this too, but I know ladies especially, if you've got troubling thoughts, if you've got things that are just shaking you to the core, that, you know, does my husband love me? He hadn't told me recently. He probably told you last week, but he hadn't told you this week, right? Uh, you know, well, you know, I, this is bothering me. That's bothering me. Take those to the Lord and notice what 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, and bring it into captivity every thought. That means to arrest it. That means to bring it into captivity. It means to secure it to the Lord. The Lord says, your thoughts to the obedience of Christ. If, you want some, if someone's going to obey something, it's brought into subjection. It's brought into submission. Your thoughts need to be brought into submission to Jesus Christ. If your thoughts are outside of God's obedience... They need to be arrested. They need to be brought into captivity, taken hold of, and brought into His direction. Because if it goes against this book, if your thoughts are out here, whirling around, 
and they're troubling, bring them into captivity to the Lord and let the Lord deal with those things. I've told folks before, it's like, okay, have you taken this to the Lord? Have you... I'll tell you a good place. Start, just go start reading through the Psalms. King David had his troubling thoughts. Just go read the Psalms sometime. And he had to bring his thoughts into subjection to Jesus and to God. Again, I know maybe I say this too much, but I, every time when there is trouble for myself in my mind or something going on, more than once what I do is I, for whatever reason, I, I, my mind goes back to where David, his men spake of stoning him. Remember that? And you know what he did? He, taught, he prayed unto God. That's where he went. He had all those around him that should have been for him talking about killing him. What did he do? He went to the Lord. That was the best place he could go to. Because then he asked the Lord, Lord, what do you need me to do? Should I go, with, should I go and fight? Should, what should I do? He went to the right source. So when you have troubling thoughts, maybe you think someone's saying something, maybe they're not saying it, but you think they're saying it, take it to the Lord. Just take it to the Lord. You see, God would have us submit ourselves and our thoughts to Him. <clears throat> uh, look at James, and we'll, we'll be done in just a moment. James chapter number 4. Notice something here. Not only should we have our thoughts submitted to the Lord, we should submit ourselves to the Lord. It says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, the, the thoughts that are against God and against what he would have you think are not of you. Now, it can be your flesh. It can be this world. But it can be also of the devil as well. But notice this. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Now, I won't finish that. Now, I know it can be talking about what we're doing too in that verse, we understand that. That could be, but also just your, just yourself in general. Submit yourself to the Lord. You know, God would have us to pray to Him. God would have us to pray to Him. Notice this: draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. How do we draw nigh to God? Well, one of the ways is of prayer. Are you praying? Are you talking to the Lord? Are you taking it to the Lord? Are you taking time with the Lord? And so we see many things here that we should be doing. We saw Christ's dialogue with His disciples concerning their faith. We saw that with Peter. Uh, for sake of time, I won't turn to some of these others here. Uh, but I, let me just say this. There is a need for certainty as a Christian. I said a, a moment ago, how, how would you ever minister to someone else if you don't trust your Lord for your own salvation. How would you ever minister to someone else if you don't trust your Lord for, for your own needs? Yeah, you can to some degree, but you're going to struggle doing so. Our certainty lies in submitting our thoughts and our lives to God. Now, Paul understood the certainty of following Christ. If you will, look at Philippians chapter number 3, and I have one more, and we'll just read that one, and we'll be done tonight. Philippians chapter number 3. And again, I want you to see how he uses this word here. Philippians 3, verse number 8. Paul is talking about his service to the Lord. And he brings up his past history, writing to the church at Philippi. And he says this, he says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You know what he said there? He's basically saying, he said, without question, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. In other words, everything that I've ever done, remember he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, that is all history. It meant nothing. In fact, even myself and what I have is nothing in comparison for my service to my Lord. You know, one of the things that help, would help, helps us the most is that if we get over ourselves... and be all about our Lord. That would change a lot of things in this life if we just get over ourselves. Pride comes into play. 
ego comes into play, what I want comes into play. I mean, fill it in. I doubt because, well, why would God ever do that to me? Well, well, wait a minute. It's you. It's still, you're putting yourself in that box. Paul understood the certainty that was needed in following the Lord. He says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Now let's turn back over to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 8. This is where we started tonight. One of the things that we need to do as Christians is that when we go to the Lord in prayer, whether we're taking something to Him in a need or we're taking a need for someone else, or maybe we're, you know, we got an intercessory prayer that we have for someone, or maybe we're just wanting to talk to the Lord. Notice 1 Timothy 2 8 again. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. What's caused you to doubt recently, Christian? What's caused you to not trust your Lord and Savior like you should? What's caused you to have doubts about what He's doing in your life? Take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Take it to Him and ask Him, ask him to help you with it. And trust Him that He will perform what He needs to perform in your life.